You guys all ready to get started? Well, let's begin with a few uh, intro introductory remarks from each of you. Um, maybe, uh, Diane, I'll begin with you to maybe share a little bit about Dominion's uh, perspectives you know, as a major utility. Just right. Well, thank you very much, Governor Hogan and the uh, Governor's Association here. Uh, you know, it's a pivotal time in the nation's energy economy. And with the focus for the entire economy on rapid decarbonization, energy is certainly uh, at the forefront of it to try to address climate change. So in my opening remarks, I'd like to talk about what we've already done as a leader, what we're doing now, and where we look to go. So on the what we've done, uh, over the last, uh, since 2005, we've reduced our carbon footprint by 50%. And we're looking to get to 80%. We've already committed to it by 2050. A lot of it has been from coal to gas conversion that has gone on over the last 15 years. And in the future, to get to the 80%, continue that conversion as well as rapid deployment of renewables. On the methane emissions side for our gas infrastructure, we've already reduced 25% of our methane emissions in the last 10 years and we've committed to getting to 50% in the next 10 years. But we're determined to go further than that, and much further than that. So what we're working on now is a very large and rapid deployment quickly of solar and offshore wind. We've announced the largest offshore wind facility in the country uh, to be installed over the next coming years. And we're the fourth largest solar developer in the country. We're extending the licenses of our nuclear fleet, which is carbon-free generation. Uh, we are going to continue the coal to gas conversion and the methane emissions reductions that we have been doing. And then we're focusing on technology, such as energy storage and hydrogen and other emerging technologies. And then what we're looking to do after we look at ourselves is what can we do in our communities to help decarbonize the economy more broadly. As an example, electric vehicle charging stations. We've announced the largest conversion of diesel school buses to electric school buses. It helps lower greenhouse gases, it helps with other pollutions and childhood asthma, and it acts as actually a utility scale battery when those buses aren't in use. We've also announced the largest nationwide program of renewable natural gas with partnerships with hog and dairy farmers throughout the country to capture methane that's escaping into the air and have it used for end use. It's actually carbon negative or carbon beneficial. And of course, uh, Governor, in your home state at Cove Point, the customers, our allies in India and Japan, are using the liquefied natural gas from our terminal to move the coal to gas conversion in those countries also. So in the next five years, we've committed to $26 billion of private investment. Uh, we are focused on emerging technologies, and what we need is regulatory and legislative partnerships to be able to have that happen so we can continue affordable, safe, reliable, secure, and clean energy. Well, thank you very much. Doug, you come at the uh, issue as both president and CEO of S&P Global and as well as the co-chair of the Bipartisan Policy Center's Executive Council on Infrastructure. So how are you approaching these issues? Well, first of all, thank you for inviting me today. It's great to be with the governors. And when I think about infrastructure, one of the best places to be is with governors because as chief executive officers of your states, you have authority, you have legislatures, you have the opportunity to invest in infrastructure and you can do it fast. When I joined the business, uh, uh, when the Bipartisan Policy Center to look at infrastructure, we took a step back to see what are the ways that the private sector can make a more positive impact. And let me talk about two of those. The first has to do with financing. I know as governors, when you look at the budgets that you have, you have gaps, and the infrastructure need in this country is huge. And we can make a case for infrastructure, clearly. It creates jobs, it creates the opportunity for growth. Every dollar of investment in infrastructure creates about $3.70 worth of growth over the next 20 years, beyond that initial dollar of infrastructure investment. 
and it also creates pride. You can see, and we heard about the opportunity to upgrade our environmental impact when you create new infrastructure. So how can you get the private sector financing into the infrastructure space? We're gonna hear later from the Canadian premiers. Canada has done a fantastic job using pension money and insurance money. Why do we talk about pension money, insurance money? It's long-term investments, and one of the best financial matches is infrastructure, which is a long-term investment. So you have this match of the funds. There are literally trillions of dollars of funds around the globe, and right now, that private sector funding for infrastructure is going to Australia Australia, to Canada, to the UK, to Spain. And even infrastructure investors in the United States are investing overseas because there's a lack of projects. So this, I would highly endorse your program. This is a program that you've talked about, the different opportunities for design, build, for design, build, operate. You don't have transfer here, but that's another one, design, build, operate, transfer. And financing is part of that. So the first appeal I'd make is to look for new ways to bring a private sector finance into infrastructure, and there's many ways to do that. The second thing I would, I would appeal to all of you is to look at the quality of your public-private partnership laws at the state level. There are today 33 states that have uh, PP, uh, P3 laws. Uh, only about half of those have been used effectively. So there's about half of those that have not really been used effectively. And that leaves 17 states that don't have P3 laws at all. And the private sector is looking at new ways to get involved in infrastructure, whether that's what I just talked about, design, it's the build, it's the operate, it's the transfer, there's many different ways to do it. It doesn't have to always be through concessions, it doesn't always have to be through privatization-like programs. Uh, you have a, a case like the Long Beach uh, Courthouse, which is a long-term contract that's built with very high quality standards of materials that will be handed back to the uh, Long Beach city at the end of the contract. The last point I make very quickly, I'm sure we'll come back to it, is permitting. Um, so the last thing is that if you're looking at a bridge and you want to have somebody build that bridge, will the banks finance something that they have to wait five years or seven years or 10 years before they even know if the bridge is gonna take place? Will the company that's building the design, will they put millions of dollars into the design to have to wait seven years or 10 years for, to find out if they even won? So permitting is also one of the barriers. And again, as governors, you have a lot of authority to make this happen. Thank you, Doug. So Sarah, Amazon is both a user and a partner in infrastructure. and. You know, how does Amazon Global Air touch on the pillars of this initiative? And since freight moves across so many different modes, including you know, our airports, highways, rail, and ports, you know, what can states do, in your estimation, to kind of modernize their transportation networks across modes? Well, first of all, uh, thank you, Governor Hogan, and thank you to the National Governors Association for your focus on infrastructure. And it truly is a privilege to be here with such a distinguished group of visionary leaders. Uh, just by brief uh, introduction, as you mentioned, I'm Sarah Rhodes. I lead Amazon's global air business. I'm originally from the great state of Montana and uh, spent four years at the Naval Academy in Governor Hogan's beautiful state of Maryland. Uh, and I've had the privilege of living and working in 11 states that are represented here today. I began my Amazon career about nine years ago as a, a operations manager with Amazon in Governor Bashir's Bluegrass State and recently settled in Governor Inslee's Evergreen State to build out an air haul network. Pretty good the way you covered all those bases. Well, I'm <laughs> you know, trying to connect with everybody. So uh, I still have about 46 other governors to get through, I think. But uh, no, I, uh, I uh, did, prior to my time with uh, Amazon, I did spend uh, several years in the Navy as a Navy F-18 fighter pilot. So for the veterans in the audience, thank you very much for your service. I, uh, I definitely appreciate what that means. So getting back to your question, Governor, uh, first of all, since 1997, Amazon has been building a network of fulfillment centers across the country. And these fulfillment center, centers are as large as of about 1.2 million square feet. And within these fulfillment centers are its product. And this product is picked, packed, and shipped on a daily basis. And these fulfillment centers are powered by our outstanding workforce and delivery partners. And we have over 500,000 employees across 40 states. And we're very proud to say that we have an industry-leading minimum wage of $15 an hour and benefits on day one. So we, uh, we definitely uh, value the, the workforce that we have. More recently, our Amazon transportation solutions, we've emerged and have been investing in things like leasing aircraft, like building sortation facilities on airport, like purchasing 
trucks and trailers and electric vehicles. And we have enabled entrepreneurs to really build out their own small businesses to deliver packages on Amazon's behalf. We've also invested in innovative technologies in the final mile delivery service. So that last portion of the supply chain that gets that package to your doorstep, we've really leaned into technology in that space. For, for my portion of, of this wider supply chain, I focus obviously on aircraft. We currently have 50 aircraft that fly across the country. We'll have 70 aircraft by the end of this year. These aircraft are 767 and 737 large wing aircraft. And we have also invested on on airport sortation facilities as well as other gateways across 26 airports in the country. So it really is amazing. For the first time this past year, we have Amazon employees loading, unloading, and marshaling aircraft for the first time ever. And even when I joined Amazon nine years ago, it certainly wasn't a thought that an e-commerce company would building out, be building out an air hole network. Now, of course, to make all of this happen, we need things like ports and railroads and airports and roads. We rely on the, the proximity of this infrastructure. And while it's not a primary driver of our decisions, whether or not to invest in an area, the, the infrastructure and the accessibility and the proximity of these, uh, these uh, important factors certainly are a variable in our decision-making pro process. Um, as mentioned, of course, uh, we wouldn't be able to do this without our workforce, so it's also very important to us that our employees have the ability to get to and from work in an efficient and simple way. So maybe as an example, in Governor Hogan State, we have two fulfillment centers in Baltimore, and we've just expanded our air operation at BWI Air Airport. We have hundreds of employees who use public transportation on a daily basis and rely on the roads and the infrastructure to get them to and from work. So um, I'm certainly uh, looking forward to the discussion today. Uh, I am a believer that speed really does matter in business and modes and nodes connect our world. And I look forward to uh, really focusing on infrastructure and answering questions today. Thank you, Sarah. So a question for all of you, you all come at it from a different perspective, and I think the governors want to hear and get your input and advice from, uh, from where you're coming from. Where do you think, get, you know, with your perspective, where are our systems and processes falling short, and, and where, where can states seize on opportunities to kind of improve on our infrastructure? Okay, uh, thank you. So you, with uh, the opening remarks that I had in working to reduce our environmental footprint, particularly in energy, because energy drives so much of the economy and the infrastructure, I think we all have the same goals to reduce the environmental footprint as fast as possible. What I would say what goes on in the states, and some of this will be what uh, Doug talked about in the permitting, is that restrictive permitting and local ordinances and other uh, issues such as that in the states sometime actually has the unintended consequence while we're trying to get to that same end goal. If we want to reduce as fast as possible, we actually end up with some of the permitting issues increasing greenhouse gases, increasing our pollution, and actually having our aging infrastructure not be able to be replaced in a timely manner. So certainly streamlining of permitting. Nobody's looking for any kind of rubber stamp, but a clear, consistent, reliable, and timely process is essential. We're investing $26 billion, and to be able to do that, to be able to finance it, it's just critical that there is that clear process to be able to go through. And then sometimes to understand and accept that if we want to get to that end goal and we want to try to do it as quickly as possible, we need to be able to install and keep running our base load, high efficiency, dispatchable generation if we want the most rapid deployment of renewables possible, which is, I believe, what everybody wants. Good points. Doug? Yeah, let me make two points. The, the first is a knowledge of what are the assets that are in your state. You would be surprised at how many states have not, don't have a centralized organization. It's, it's dispersed across the entire state of what are the assets, what are the bridges, what are the ports, what, what are the even buildings that are owned. This is something that's absolutely critical. The, the state of Pennsylvania, I see uh, Governor Wolf over here, they put together a program where they have a concession for 558 bridges. So as a bundling of their bridge assets to have them maintained and rebuilt over a period, there was about a third of what it would have taken if it would not have 
have been done in the, by the private sector. So there's, but you could have never done that if you didn't have the inventory of the assets. In addition, the financial markets are looking for an inventory, so to speak, of po projects in a pipeline. Uh, Governor Cuomo would not have been able to perform the uh, project at LaGuardia to renew the airport there if there hadn't been a pipeline of projects which were known by the financial markets that are coming up in New York State that they can start planning for. So the first is having inventory assets and a pipeline of projects. And the second is really about how do you think about infrastructure. In too many places, I've seen infrastructures thought about as procurement. It's the annual budget cycle, and it's not an annual budget cycle. Infrastructure has to be thought of as a life cycle investment over the long term. So the word investment, not procurement. States need to look at as an investment in infrastructure and all the benefits it brings, not as annual procurement. Thank you, sir. Uh, I, I think uh, taking a proactive versus a reactive approach, and I, I think about a term that we use at Amazon often, and it's uh, looking around corners. And I'll give uh, two examples, uh, Florida and Illinois as it relates to our business. And I, I use the, I guess, the, the famous quote from Field of Dreams, if you build it, they will come. And I think about the facility that we're building right now in Lakeland, Florida that will launch this summer, as well as our expansion that we just completed last year in Rockford, Illinois, where we partnered with the, the airport and the, the local, state, and federal government representatives uh, to really do something that was mutually beneficial for both the business as well as the local community and the state. So uh, they leaned in, uh, did an investment before we really were committed to um, uh, operating out of those sites and it, it became a, a great uh, relationship and, and partnership uh, between uh, our Amazon Air organization and uh, the Rockford and, and uh, Lakeland communities. Thank you. So, Doug, um, public-private partnerships have been around for a while, but they're still, as you mentioned, fairly underutilized. Um, and some states are taking advantage, some are not. How, and, and it's a discussion some of us are having, how should states evaluate whether or not a P3 might be something they ought to consider? How should they balance the risks between the public and private sector? Well, this, the, one of the words you used, risk, is, is critical, and I'll, I'll come to that. So first of all, the public-private partnerships, I think they become an imperative because states don't have the financial resources to undertake the amount of infrastructure investment which is going to be required to meet the needs of, of Amazon and Dominion. If you think about where we're going to be heading with the modernizing our infrastructure, updating it, and we also heard that there is a, there is a demand from my children and uh, new generations coming up to have a completely different approach to the environment and sustainability of our infrastructure. And when you look at that renewal, having the public-private partnership is, is one of the best ways to do that. So when you look at it, first of all, it, you can use it for financing. You can use it for models of design. You have them here in your, in your uh, foundational principles. And to put together this uh, approach, when I uh, worked as the co-chair of the Bipartisan Policy Center uh, Executive Committee on Infrastructure, we put in place a ideal or a draft of a proposed uh, P3 law, that which we think all states could look at to see if the, if the P3 law they already have is going to meet these standards or if they don't have one, they can use this as a base standard uh, for a, a P3 law. In addition to financing, you have the idea of risk sharing. Who's going to take the risk? You can put the risk back to the private sector. The private sector is willing to underwrite projects and take risk much more than they would uh, if it's if if they were not going to operate. So there's an opportunity to bring the financing, to have the, to have the risk sharing. And, and then one of the things you have to overcome, though, is it's, it's still true that people think that infrastructure should be owned by the government. There's this question about who does have the responsibility for infrastructure. And through a P3 law, you can be very clear about what are the, what are the roles and risks and responsibilities along the entire value chain of infrastructure. And good P3 laws also define very specifically who's taking the risk, who has the responsibility, and you can transfer that to the public sector, to the private sector. Great, thank you. Um, Diane, so uh, you talked to something about investing in some of the serious technological advances in your industry. Can you talk a little bit about some of the innovations and, and technologies that you're most focused on? 
Sure, I'd probably put it into two categories. For those technologies that have been deployed for a while right now, how can you drive down the cost? How can you improve the efficiency? So as a couple of examples, you think about the car you're driving and the fuel efficiency or the computers you're buying are so much cheaper and a lot more uh, you know, juice in them and you get so much more memory than you used to. So offshore wind, just 10 years ago, if we would put in a wind turbine on land, it was less than one megawatt. We now have two test turbines going in and offshore Virginia that are now six megawatts. And the ones that we will be installing in the largest offshore wind facility that we just announced are going to be 12 megawatts or even more. So the, the newer technology, so you think in the same environmental footprint, investing in that technology to drive costs down and uh, the scale and the size up, having more solar uh, power be created with a smaller environmental footprint. So we're investing and focusing a lot of those technologies to be able to get more. The uh, advanced combined cycles for natural gas are 25, 30% more efficient than they were just 10 years ago, so fuel efficiency. Then it's focusing on new technologies that can really drive us down to a new level in greenhouse gases and pollution and energy, such as energy storage and batteries, hydrogen, advanced nuclear, those types of technologies that are not here yet, but we need to be able to pilot and drive those to be able to really move our energy economy forward. Thank you. Um, Sarah, from a shipping and freight perspective, uh, what are some of the emerging technology opportunities for states to enhance efficiency and maybe reduce congestion or speed up sure. delivery? Uh, well, first of all, I would, I would encourage states to, to use data and facts and leverage things like technology and machine learning to, first of all, provide an informed set of information to then drive informed decisions. Uh, that's the approach that we've taken. And, and for example, um, instead of uh, building out an air haul network that's a traditional hub and spoke where all the aircraft fly into one location, everything's sorted, then they fly out, we actually have an overlay of hub and spoke and a point-to-point -point network that is a result of really complex algorithms to drive a simple solution, which has resulted in a reduction in the number of aircraft actually required to fly the same amount of packages. So it's uh, good from a sustainability perspective, it's good for efficiency, it's, it's good for cost. Uh, so out of out of data and information came uh, the decision to build out our network like that. Uh, and also, just to touch on sustainability, uh, we're certainly leaning in in that space as well. Uh, we're investing in electric uh, ground service equipment. Uh, I think about our facility at Alliance Fort Worth in Texas. We have the, uh, we are the launch customer of the world's first electric main deck loader. So the piece of equipment that loads the containers onto our large 767 aircraft. So it's been great really uh, experimenting and trialing that type of technology and equipment in our, in our space. Great, thank you. At this point, we're gonna open it up to uh, that, let some of our other governors get into the discussion. So uh, yeah, please, we want to just get, light up some lights and, and start asking some questions of our panelists. Governor Cuomo. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Governor Hogan, and thank you to all the members of the panel. Uh, P3, as you said, uh, and Governor Hogan said, has been around a long time, and uh, money is a problem, right, on top of everything else, the permitting, et cetera. Uh, what do you think are the most, ha have replicable models developed on the P3 process, and what are the most replicable P3s that you've done? Uh, well, first of all, I have, uh, when we did the Bipartisan Policy Center, we went and did field trips to different cities. We went to Detroit, to Miami, to Long Beach, to New York. Uh, we went to Virginia and visited Richmond. And what we saw were different examples of what works in a P3. And I, I mentioned earlier that one of the most important aspects is to think about it as an investment, not through procurement. And when you do a P3, it actually forces you into that methodology because you're saying that this project, which is 
can be managed with a public-private partnership requires a different sort of a discipline when it just is a procurement project. So just having the project itself is critical. Another aspect is, is what is included in this infrastructure for success, the foundation for success, is a definition of all the different uh, aspects along the way. There's a design aspect, there's a build aspect, there's an operate aspect, there's a finance aspect, a maintain aspect, uh, the transfer either privately run after or before. And so there's different models, there's best practices, the, the uh, Port of Miami, the tunnel at the Port of Miami, the, the Long Beach, uh, the Long Beach uh, city, uh, city Courthouse, the uh, Port at Richmond, Virginia, you, you have LaGuardia in New York. So there are a lot of very good practices that could be learned and copied. Usually we hear about the failures, and there are some failures, there's some roads that failed. And um, just to echo the comments about uh, data and analytics, there are now more than ever opportunities to use data and analytics for different sorts of variable pricing. We're looking now, I live in New York, and we're looking in New York how we're gonna have different sorts of variable pricing in the city. Hong Kong and Singapore have variable pricing. London has it, it works for transit. So there's a lot of models, and one of the best things to do working with Governor Hogan would be to get a group together of governors, and we'd, be, we'd love to work with you to find all of those best practices and share them across all the states. Thank you. you. Guys are being much too quiet. We have an opportunity to talk to some really smart experts here. You guys have to wake up, <laughs> ask some questions. Well, while you're thinking of your next question, I'll, uh, I'll fill in and ask another yes. one then. Yes. You have a question. Oh, go ahead. Governor, please. So Guam is way out in the Pacific Ocean and uh, we have a lot of uh, sun out there. Can you speak to the role of uh, solar energy in this whole um, process and presentation that you made? Uh, sure, it, it plays an absolute critical role in uh, being able to move towards a, a net zero or zero carbon economy. Uh, and be able to address decarbonization. Uh, so you know, we've been putting in uh, about you know, 1,000 megawatts of solar a year, so it certainly plays a role. Um, but battery technology really needs to be coupled with it, and I would give you twofold. There's the batteries that a lot of the technology for batteries has started from the electric vehicle sector. So it does tend to be four to eight hour batteries. Very helpful for a lot of the picture, but to be able to have a secure, reliable energy grid, need to actually have multi-day storage also. So if there does happen to be a storm that goes through uh, for several days, batteries with solar can handle an enormous amount. So by installing that rapidly, as California and North Carolina and other states have started to do, it can address decarbonizing very quickly, but to have a secure grid, you do need to have multi-day storage and dispatchable baseload generation partnering with it as you continue that journey. I'll, I'll add as well, uh, I think about our fulfillment centers that I mentioned. We have solar panels on top of over 50 fulfillment centers across the United States, including on top of uh, Governor Hogan's fulfillment center in Baltimore. Uh, we're building out a large central hub at the Cincinnati Northern Kentucky International Airport, and we're planning on putting solar panel on top of that facility as well to put energy back into the grid. Uh, so it's certainly uh, something that we're thinking about uh, both uh, on the, the business and commercial side in addition to the utilities. So um, a, several of you touched on uh, kind of the regulatory uh, landscape and permitting, uh, the regulatory process. Um, and, and it's an issue that we hear a lot about, um, both at the federal and state level. And so, and it's something governors are concerned about and the private sector is concerned about. What, what do you see as some of the opportunities for governors uh, uh, to, to, to support streamlining uh, and bringing about maybe more transparency and, and a, a clearer process uh, for per the permitting and uh, for infrastructure? So, so what I've seen is that the, the fastest way to do it is to require there be a single 
approval process, single permitting process that you can't get lost across multiple agencies. This is where it's worked in, in some states. And as an example right now um, is that the federal government, there's something called the FAST Act. The FAST Act has, was something the last two administrations have both tried to find ways to increase infrastructure. The FAST Act has sped up infrastructure approvals by 2.3 years and saved uh, billions of dollars by being able to get the infrastructure in uh, case moving much faster. But for me, the most important thing is to streamline the approvals and get one agency to own the approvals. And if it needs to go to multiple agencies, it has to be done in a way that it gets streamlined and, and sped up. It's, this is definitely the most frustrating thing when you speak with the construction companies, with the financial institutions, with the designers, uh, with architects, with et cetera, et cetera. They, the thing they're most frustrated with is permitting. I, I would add in there a, just the consistency of process. Be clear what the process is. It is based on these regulations, these laws, with a target time frame with which there can be some certainty to be able to start investing. With these large infrastructure projects, you are investing years before you put it in and you hire the construction contractors. And so when the time frames go or the process isn't clear, it ends up extending on for a very long time. So clarity of process and consistent, clear time frames. Can I add one more other sure. point, which is since we have all the, uh, so many governors here, sometimes the other aspect that really slows it down is when an infrastructure project crosses state boundaries. So if you have a bridge or a tunnel that goes between two states, that also can really slow it down because sometimes you're gonna have two states with their approval processes with multiple agencies on both sides of the border. Maybe there's county approvals, city approvals, et cetera. And you look across all the different agencies approving it, it, it can be very difficult. So I'd also recommend that the governors in the spirit of this uh, new program find ways to cooperate when infrastructure crosses uh, state boundaries. Well, it's a very good point. We were, we were just in the process, we've just approved a, a major uh, interstate agreement with the state of Virginia on the Cap Capitol Beltway here surrounding Washington. Governor Northam and I are doing a new American Legion bridge that connects the two states across the Potomac River. Uh, I had a good discussion yesterday with many of the Canadian premiers who are going to be joining us in the next panel about uh, bridges connecting across borders. Uh, and it's, so it's a big discussion uh, about how we do this. It's difficult enough to get infrastructure done within a state, but when you're dealing across states uh, and across uh, international borders, it's even more confusing. Uh, and dealing with local governments as well. Yep, Hogan. Yep. First, uh, Sarah, I think you omitted notice that you are, I think, the first female F-18 combat pilot. So not bad from a girl from Butte. No. Sure. <laughs> not bad. <laughs> And also, though, one of the things he did say is, like, when you're looking at where to place something, you do look at the base infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And we see that in business. We also see that in the livability of our communities. That's why so many of the state governors, like, we passed our largest infrastructure package in our state's history a year ago. Over 30 states have increased the gas tax um, at the state level just in the last six years. Uh, but states can't do this alone, either. It's all of you that think about this a lot, in addition to permitting reform, what do you think our country's expectations and governor's expectations should be out of the federal government when it comes to more comprehensive infrastructure package? Yeah, I, I look at this uh, as their federal government does have a critical role, especially in roads, ports, airports. We talk about you're in the, you're in the, the flight industry, you're in the natural gas and energy industry. This is where you also have national interests. Uh, when it comes to the, the uh, FAA, we're looking at what will be the, the current system to manage air travel and air traffic controller. And the system is it's pretty old. There needs to be a comprehensive effort. It could never be done by the states. The only way you could ever up, upgrade and update the entire air traffic control system in the United States would have to be done by the federal government. Similarly, the road system, there's a, the last time the, uh, that the uh, transportation uh, bill was passed, there was a convoluted way to find financing for it. The states need to put pressure on the federal government to build the roads that are the, the uh, national road system. Uh, the same goes with some of the rail systems. So the national government does have a critical ro a role to play, especially in transportation. 
Well, great. Well, thank you very much. Please join me in thanking our panel for this wonderful discussion. Thank you very much for joining us. Very helpful. Thank you. Thank you so thank much. You. Really good. Thanks, Governor. Now, while we switch out before in between panels, just draw, put, draw your attention to the screens. We'll have a short uh, video as we switch some chairs out before we get to our uh, Canadian premieres. I think they're going to dim the lights and show you a film. One of the things that makes America exceptional is that when we see something that's broken, we go out and fix it, or at least we try to. The time to fix America's infrastructure is now. We just simply can't wait any longer. A new report from the American Society of Civil Engineers gives the nation's infrastructure a D plus. The federal government needs to spend large sums of money to repair and rebuild America's infrastructure. It's important at the, at the national level, at the state level, and at the local levels. Four million miles of roads and more than 600,000 bridges across the United States. In many cases, crumbling faster than they can be repaired. It's something that, quite frankly, um, we haven't been able to get moving forward on in Washington. There's bipartisan support for a plan, but on Capitol Hill, the divide is always over how to pay for it. Everybody could agree that our crumbling roads and bridges and our inadequate infrastructure is something that needs to be addressed. You could go to any major city in America and see roads and bridges and infrastructure that need to be fixed. In fact, it's something that the White House and both houses of Congress on both sides of the aisle have been talking about. The issue at hand, Paula, is infrastructure. Is bipartisanship possible there? If they can't make any progress on this issue, on infrastructure, then it's unlikely they're going to be able to make any progress on anything. Governors in every state are making progress and are moving forward with infrastructure projects. Do you believe state by state this can be addressed? There's disagreement among Republicans and Democrats about how to solve these problems but we're actually getting things done in the states. Uh, in our state, for example, we're moving forward on every single top priority road project in the entire state in every jurisdiction. Construction is underway to improve one of Maryland's busiest roadways in Montgomery County, Maryland. Today, a major construction project starts that could impact your commute for years. There is a new plan to ease congestion for about 700,000 drivers a day on 14 major roads and highways across Maryland. Uh, we have 800 road projects under construction, totally $9 billion. We have $14 billion invested in transit. All of America's infrastructure is aging and underinvested in, and we're trying to take a look at solutions for all of these issues and problems that states across America are dealing with, and issues that we haven't really addressed at the national level. So we've been holding infrastructure summits in various cities around the country and around the world. We've already been to Boston, to Detroit, San Francisco. We went to Australia, who really has done a tremendous job with respect to infrastructure and, and public-private partnerships on rebuilding their infrastructure. The private sector has been investing billions of dollars for a long, long time and helping state and federal government rebuild their infrastructure without tax increases. We're getting the best input from around the country and from around the world to try to figure out all of the possible solutions to our infrastructure crisis. So our initiative on rebuilding America's infrastructure isn't just about transportation. It's really about rebuilding all of America's infrastructure. So we're talking about our, our infrastructure on the grid. We're talking about cybersecurity. We're talking about water systems. And all of America's infrastructure is aging and underinvested in. Maybe we could come up with a set of recommendations to make for the folks in Washington to see if we can't find some bipartisan, common sense solutions uh, to recommend to them. This is about helping people's everyday lives. Those people that are stuck in soul-crushing traffic every day, that are missing soccer games, that aren't able to spend time with their families. We want to get them home from work, back home with their families. They're not being productive in our economy when they're sitting stuck in traffic. I really want to thank all of the governors and all of the staff who's worked so hard on this initiative for participating, for helping us on this very important initiative for NGA. Wow, well, that was pretty good while we're switching out the chairs, right? Well, so uh, our next panel, we're very excited uh, to get an international 
perspective on infrastructure. Uh, earlier, I had a chance to uh, meet with uh, Mexico's current ch uh, chair of the governors, the uh, Canago. Uh, uh, the current chair is Francisco Dominguez and the incoming chair, Governor Carlos Mendoza. Uh, and so we've got both uh, representatives from from Mexico and Canada. Up here on the stage, we're really thrilled uh, to, to have uh, with us a total of five premiers from our neighbors to the north. Uh, we very much appreciate everybody making the tremendous effort to come down here and join us. They're gonna be having, uh, joining us for this discussion on, on infrastructure from an international perspective. I believe that Canada is doing some really interesting and creative things on infrastructure, so we wanna thank each one of you for joining us. We have uh, Saskatchewan Premier Scott Moe, who is the chair of of the Council of the Federation, which is our equivalent, is sort of like the NGA of uh, Canada. Uh, Quebec Premier, uh, Franz, Fran Francois Legault. Ontario Premier, Doug Ford. Uh, New Brunswick Premier, Blaine Higgs. And Alberta Premier, Jason Kennedy. Please give them a big NGA welcome. Thank you, gentlemen, very much for joining us. Thank you very much. So we have a great uh, partnership between uh, the COF and the NGA, and uh, thank you very much for, for being here with us. I'd like to just start the discussion uh, by asking each of you uh, what your priorities are uh, as it relates to infrastructure and what our states can learn from uh, the, uh, the approaches and the investments. Uh, and I'll start with you, Mr. Chairman. Well, thank you, thank you very much, Larry, and thank you uh, to all of the governors here, and thank you for the relationship that we have had over the course of the last year uh, between the the NGA and the Council of Federation or COF in, uh, in in Canada. It's appreciated, and and I look forward to to it as we as we move along. Uh, we've we've done all of the different types of infrastructure in Canada, P3s. We've done the public investment, obviously, and and really uh, worked with our private sector to ensure that that there's maximum opportunity for that private in, that private investment across what is a, a very integrated economy. I mean, whether it's across the U.S., across Canada, or I would say even more so across North America and, and, and what we can do to enhance the opportunity for that stronger continental economy, if you will. And before you invest in infrastructure, you need to have the trade agreements. And I would like to take the opportunity for uh, not only the leadership on the negotiation for our USMCA, the modernization of NAFTA that, uh, that uh, was uh, in many ways led by the United States of America, to thank you for that. Thank you for the ratification. And uh, from Canada's perspective, all 13 premiers have uh, have put put forward bipartisan support for that agreement to be ratified and ratified very uh, quickly without delay in our federal parliament. And I think you will see as the as the weeks go by that you will have that bipartisan support at our federal level. And I think it is uh, one more step for us to uh, building that continental uh, infrastructure that we need to ensure that we have a stronger economy, uh, not just in our respective nations, but across North America. And, and, uh, and so I do want to take the opportunity on behalf of all of the premiers to say thank you to each and every one of you in this room and, and the U.S. administration for uh, the, the trade agreement that we now have. And, and not to interrupt, but we want to thank you because our two organizations and the governors and the premiers working together to try to make this happen, and we want to thank you for your leadership as well. Yeah. <clears throat> so... Uh, we're just going to go down the line and let each of you That's go right. ahead and, okay, and tell so us what... Uh, my name is François Legault. I'm the premier of Quebec, so uh, Quebec includes Montreal. Uh, as you can hear, uh, we speak French <laughs> in Quebec. Um, I'm a, a new premier. I was an entrepreneur, and I started a new party. And uh, last year, we won uh, a majority government for the next four years. So now I have to deliver the goods. And uh, maybe uh, two subjects uh, rapidly that I would like to chat with you. First, uh, transportation. Uh, large cities in North America will invest a lot in trains, streetcars, subways uh, in the next few years. And there are four major companies in the world. You have a company in China called CRRC. You have a company in Germany called Siemens. You have a company in France called Alstom. And you have a company in Quebec called Bombardier. There's no US company making those products. So I think there's a great opportunity to work together to build a champion of these products in North America. 
But right now, we have a challenge with Buy America and Buy American. The requirement of 70% doesn't permit us to integrate our companies together. Second subject, very rapidly, hydroelectricity. Uh, Quebec uh, has very large surpluses of hydroelectricity. We already have agreements with Vermont, with Massachusetts, with New York, and we're in negotiation with Mr. de Blasio at the city of New York to export uh, uh, more hydroelectricity, cheap and clean energy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Premier Ford. Well, first of all, thank, thank you, uh, Governor Hogan, for inviting us down here. And, and, uh, and I know on April 21st, April 23rd. Yeah, make the plug. Uh, I, I, I got to make the plug here. Thank you. Yes, uh, we invite uh, all, all the governors up to Toronto. It's one of the most beautiful cities in the world. And I invite uh, the, the folks listening to us to come up as well. I just want to mention to uh, all our governors. That in the next summit of our infrastructure tour. That's right. We're going to be hosting us. In and we, we have some of the experts. We are experts when it comes to P3s, public-private partnerships. Uh, we, we do over $300 billion a year, Ontario alone, uh, with the United States. If we were a standalone country, we'd be the third largest trading partner to the U.S. We're the number one customer to 19 states. We're number two to nine other states. And we'd love to have you come up, sit down and talk about public-private partnerships. Our government is investing $144 billion. I'm going to repeat that, $144 billion into infrastructure. Uh, I think that's one of the highest in, in North America. Uh, we're focusing right now on 32 projects uh, with P3s totaling $64 billion. Areas like transit, we're building one of the largest subway systems in North America to add on to our great subway system of $28.5 billion. I'd like to invite you, your family and friends to come up April 21st, 23rd. Maybe we'll even get you to one of those Raptor championship uh, team that we have up in, up in Toronto. And that's probably, I think, is going to be the playoff uh, time. So we look forward to winning uh, the championship one more time. So thank you, everyone. If you thank make you. the playoffs. Premier. Uh, we'll make the playoffs. <laughs> Premier Higgs. Thank you, uh, Governor Horgan. So I'm uh, Premier of New Brunswick, and, and we um, have the largest refinery in, in uh, Canada, and it, it would supply refined product to 80% um, of the market, Boston and North. And, and through that, in the forestry sector, 40% of the imports of, of pulpwood goes into, into Maine and feeds mills and, and sawmills. Uh, the, 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 we have 17 border crossings between ourselves uh, and, the, and the state of Maine. So we're very integrated. We're, we, when we talk about an integrated economy, we're not only integrated in, in uh, economic terms, but we're integrated in family terms. And, and as I said this morning, uh, you know, the, the borders have become not, uh, at one time they were, they were kind of an inconvenience. My dad was a border guard for 25 years. And, uh, but now they've become a barrier. And, and it's, it's a movement that we have back and forth. And I feel like we're, we're not trading, um, you know, we're not trading opponents, we're, we're trading partners. And we've always been kind of joined at the hip in that regard. In, in talking about the infrastructure that we, we watched here in this video, what, what I find the, the partisan uh, politics, very much um, the priorities don't get set on the needed projects. We don't have flexibility coming from, let's say, the federal counterparts in order to focus on the needs of a particular province. And we end up building things we don't need. And we do it so we can cut a ribbon and, and put, take a photograph. And that's why our, our infrastructure is in the state it's in. Because we haven't been able to focus on an asset management program. We haven't been able to focus on what's needed and do it in a priority. And certainly, we haven't been able to keep it to go from <coughs> one election from one government to the next. Now, I'm a minor, in a minority government uh, with, with a, a third party kind of working together. So uh, I likely, it's hard to say whether I'll be here next year or not. But, but in any case, we're going to focus on getting results on the things that are needed. And I think that's what that video was saying. Yeah, thank you. Premier Kenny. Jason Kenny from Alberta, the Rocky Mountain province in the west, and uh, we are the single largest supplier of energy to the United States. Forty percent of your energy imports come from my province with the world's third largest uh, accessible oil reserves and also huge natural gas reserves, which is a huge, I think, advantage to American and continental energy security uh, and independence. 
Uh, with that energy wealth comes the need for enormous infrastructure. And increasingly, we are seeking to build green infrastructure as we move into the period of energy transition. We uh, want to learn from a lot of the states, Governor, that have been very forward-leaning on, on P3s and in innovative ways of paying for the infrastructure that we, we can't, the taxpayers cannot afford directly. Um, I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, we've been major investors as a government in uh, carbon capture utilization and storage technology, which we think is becoming increasingly commercially viable. And we're running a, a carbon trunk line from uh, some of our refineries that are capturing carbon, and it will be injecting it into our sedimentary conventional oil basin to allow for enhanced oil recovery with a, a net negative carbon score. Um, so that kind of, that's a, that's a sort of P3 project and we see a lot of opportunity for that in the future. Second and, and point is that uh, uh, Alberta-based companies want to invest billions of dollars in modernizing and expanding energy infrastructure in your states. Uh, for example, uh, Enbridge, the largest uh, pipeline company in North America based in, in Alberta, uh, is seeking to spend $600 million to modernize the uh, Line 5 pr uh, project that's 60 years old under the Straits of Mackinac to make it safe, bury it under the lake bed, um, to be a reliable supplier of energy to the upper Midwest for years to come. Just met with Governor of Minnesota about uh, their effort as well uh, to replace a 60-year-old uh, pipe through Minnesota to Wisconsin uh, through Line 3 uh, to create modern and safe technology, a lot safer than moving energy by train. And finally, the Keystone XL project where TC Energy is prepared to spend billions of dollars, as you know, uh, through four U.S. states uh, to expand and modernize energy infrastructure. So we are committed to um, becoming, to being really a global leader in green tech in, in the uh, non-renewable resource sector, also moving towards renewables, but continuing to be the largest supplier of energy to the United States, hopefully through this modern infrastructure. Uh, thank you very much. So um, we touched on this a little bit, but the cross-border infrastructure is so vital between our, our two countries, uh, between our states and provinces. Um, how can your provinces and our states work together uh, to improve cross-border infrastructure? I'll start with you, Chairman Mo. Well, I, I would say uh, we just we keep discussing on, on the state to province level as well as our, at our, our federal administrations. Hey, listen, the, the benefits are, are just too large to walk away from. And, and uh, for instance, you can start with air, of course, but road and rail infrastructure, of which we desperately need uh, going across the border and our, our border ports, of which we've had some discussions on uh, over the course of the late last year with uh, Governor Bullock and others. Um, but we, we need the road and rail infrastructure so we can bring in those big red tractors and those green combines from Illinois so that we can uh, grow our oats and our, our canola and send that back down to be refined into canola oil and oats and then you know create jobs in Iowa and other places uh, in, in the US so that we can ship this this agri food product then around the world and it, you can see how it's beneficial for not only us in Canada but for the the agri food processing sector in the US well the same holds true and we would be uh, likely this one of the likely the second largest energy producer in in the nation uh, barring possibly Possibly Newfoundland, we're back and forth a little bit, but the, the energy infrastructure that crosses our borders, and, and we're doing some within the nation as well, we're just approved for a, uh, the TMX pipeline going out to the west coast of Canada. Uh, but the Keystone XL pipeline, for example, I think we need to uh, remember that same narrative of, of adding value to a, a North American energy product that in, down in the Gulf Coast and then shipping that uh, not only to uh, North Americans to utilize, but around the world. And, and we need to remember what that product is. It is one of the most sustainable products available uh, in, compared to products that are coming from other areas around the world. For example, Jason, uh, Premier Kenny, pardon me, had uh, mentioned that uh, they're using carbon capture and storage. We're using carbon capture and storage off a coal-fired power plant as well, taking that carbon, adding it to carbon that's coming out of the gasification plants in North Dakota, and, uh, and putting that into enhanced oil recovery, uh, bumping up our harvest, uh, driving down our carbon uh, per barrel of oil. We have a methane action plan with our thermal plants up in the Lloydminster area that are driving our methane emissions down 40 to 45%. That 
That's the energy that's going in that pipe alongside other energy that is picked up in Montana and North Dakota along the way and putting people uh, to work with good careers down in the Gulf Coast, putting, putting uh, people in Texas and, and Louisiana uh, to work in providing those jobs and providing the world with uh, comparatively much more, a much more sustainable pro products. So the, the, the benefit of us working together with these cross-border efforts is, is, truly, is truly beneficial. And I would summarize it with this. Uh, the benefit of us and our Canadian Football League of importing American college football players has greatly enhanced uh, the, the caliber of football in our football league. And I would also say that the benefit of, of uh, Canadian exports of hockey players uh, to the U.S. has... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> has greatly enhanced the, the opportunity for, for the, the, the National Hockey League to, well, and, and the Capitals. One not that long ago and three Saskatchewan boys on the St. Louis Blues right. this, this last year. <laughs> and uh, the benefits are huge and we should always be striving towards uh, uh, those benefits for our economy and of course our, our professional sports organizations. That's pretty good. A Premier Lego. Yeah. I think when we talk about infrastructure in 2020, we also need to talk about environment. How can we reduce the greenhouse gases in North America? Do our share to save the planet. And I'm very proud to say that if you take the 60 states and provinces in North America, Quebec is first. Uh, we have the lowest greenhouse gas per capita in Quebec. The reason for that is hydroelectricity. We have surpluses that we're trying to uh, export. But even if we have the lowest greenhouse gas per capita, we want to do more. So that's why if one of you, one of the governors, uh, has uh, some projects about electric cars, about electric trucks, about electric buses. And like I said, so if somebody is interested to have a partnership uh, with a company making trains, subways, and streetcars, I would like to talk to your people and see what we can do together. Because we really need to reduce those greenhouse gas. And I think that the young people are asking for that. And we have a responsibility. Thank you, Premier Ford. Oh, thank you. Thank you, uh, Premier Legault, for leading into we also produce trains, planes, automobiles <laughs> Bombardier. Uh, in, in, in Ontario and, and Bombardier. And uh, we were number two to Michigan. We're just slowly, uh, just slightly behind, I should say. Uh, Michigan, we produce over two million automobiles a, a year. We have the big five up there. But uh, going back to the infrastructure, um, we're looking at bilateral agreements with with states, so we can we can work from province to state. Uh, Governor DeWine, I know our, our group we're working together to, uh, to put a, a great uh, program together to make things easier for for the infrastructure folks from from Ohio to come up and invest in 144 billion dollars. Uh, that's one of the largest infrastructure projects in North America that you can get involved in. We have a great organization in uh, Toronto and part of uh, part of the Ontario government called Infrastructure Ontario. Uh, they're experts. We're, we're, you know, we're one of the best in the world. I'll give a plug to our friends in Australia. They're good. We've been doing it for years. Uh, we outsource that technology. So if you come up April 21st to April 23rd, uh, we'll set you up with the experts in Infrastructure Ontario and uh, show you folks how we can do public-private partnerships. But come up, take advantage of the $144 billion that we have there, the $28.5 billion uh, subway uh, project that we're doing and a wide range of other infrastructure projects. Ontario is an economic powerhouse in North America. He's quite the salesman. <laughs> Premier Higgs. You know, thinking about the integration between our borders, I, I think of a project up in the uh, northwestern New Brunswick um, in uh, Edmiston, Madawaska, so up northern Maine is. And we're building, a, there's a new bridge infrastructure plan there to, to connect. And, and the interesting thing about that area, and when I talk about the, uh, the integration of our, our trade and our, our activities, we have a pulp mill on the New Brunswick side of the, of the border, 
uh, that feeds a, uh, a paper mill on the, on the main side of the border. So the two are, are linked. Uh, we, we, we brings us to the, the softwood lumber agreement and the 20% tariffs that are currently on, on our producers, or, the, or at least 50% of our producers. And, and the, if you look at the whole supply chain within, within between Maine and New Brunswick, we have a very integrated flow of, of chips, of pulpwood, of tops, of, of uh, um, going back and forth that feed the industries on either side of the border. So the infrastructure that we have that moves our, our materials around is, uh, is, is unique, I think, in terms of the integration, but it's, it's strategic in order for us to maintain that business, business uh, atmosphere and that business to be viable. Speaking of Maine, by the way, Governor Mills, I don't know if she's here, but we will be having our summer meeting in Maine, and we're looking forward to Toronto, but we also invite you to cross over the border right from where you are to come to visit us. A lot of the governors will be at the summer meeting in Maine, so it won't be that far to go. So to that point, you know, I think of Campobello <laughs> Island, where President Roosevelt's summer home was. Yeah. We can't even get to that without going through Maine. So we're, well, you know, we talk about access and such, and I, I suppose you've probably been to Campobello. There you go. Okay, well, Premier Kenny. Well, I think your question was about cross-border infrastructure. I just make one point that to echo what we heard from the private sector panel, which is uh, how critically important regulatory certainty is in moving forward because... Uh, you have the same but, kinds of issues? Exactly. <laughs> uh, and, I mean, Doug can talk to this in Ontario, but I, I know uh, I was in the federal government. When we announced the, uh, the, Detroit, the new Detroit-Windsor br uh, border crossing bridge, the Gordie Howe Bridge, oh, yeah. I think in 2010 or 2011, it's a decade ago, yeah. And as you know, that became a huge political fight and years and years and years of delay. The opportunity costs, the infrastructure costs go up. The reg I mean, the only people that make money on these deals are the lobbyists and the lawyers. And we have the same thing going on with the Keystone XL pipeline, which uh, has now, you know, there was a, a seven-year process leading to a veto, and then two presidential permits and endless litigation. Finally, it appears to be ready to proceed. But this, you know, um, investors are not prepared to wait endlessly to risk their shareholders' money in these kinds of projects. And neither should we, as political leaders, when approvals are, are, are given, especially on cross-border infrastructure, we have to seize the day and move forward. Very good. Thank you. We're going to open up and see if there are any questions from our governors. Anybody? Governor Hogan, I'll take one. I don't see where that's coming from, but go right, jump right in. Thank you. Um, <laughs> I'm curious uh, for the premiers, as you are uh, developing and implementing infrastructure projects, I'm curious what your process is in terms of consultation with your First Nations and your partnerships with your First Nations as you're developing these projects. Well, I, I can speak to that uh, quickly, and I know Premier Kenny will have some words as well as he has uh, developed some very positive uh, relations and processes uh, with uh, the, the Indigenous communities in Alberta. We have, uh, I'll use our forestry sector as an example in the northern areas where, where, I, where I live uh, of Saskatchewan, it's actually central Saskatchewan, but everyone refers to it as, as the northern areas, where we have uh, really integrated uh, the Indigenous communities and, and people into the forestry sector. We actually have about a 35% employment rate uh, in the forestry sector. They own businesses that are operating uh, in that sector now and it's been a, it's been a successful partnership. It, it compares uh, across the nation to about a 4% uh, saturation of Indigenous employment in, in that particular sector. So it's been successful. It's been successful uh, uh, for communities to be uh, integrated not only in the employment uh, area but also to be uh, um, owning businesses and operating businesses that are working in there and really to uh, be part of the sector, if you will. And so that, that integration, it, uh, it didn't come easily and it didn't come quickly. Uh, it came uh, through long conversations and sometimes two steps forward, one step backwards, but uh, through uh, the, it, it was most certainly worth it. We have the, a similar uh, story to tell when it comes to the integration in our, our uranium mining industry in the northern areas of Saskatchewan as well, another clean uh, fuel source uh, where they were running about 46%, I believe, was northern and aboriginal employment in that industry uh, with the companies, uh, again, that had worked very hard to achieve those numbers. Uh, it's, it's been successful. Um, but there's more work to do, and I think Premier Kenny can speak about some of the current work in Alberta. In Canada, there's a, a constitutional principle that has developed through recent jurisprudence in the last couple of decades that the Crown, the state, has an obligation to consult with Indigenous people on any infrastructure in their traditional territories. And we're finally starting to get clar clarity about what that means. Uh, and, uh, you, you know, it, it has created some investor uncertainty. And, and, and at the same time, um, 
it has helped to bend the curve where, where pro the private sector is now much more willing to be proactive, to engage, to, to, to approach First Nations communities with benefit agreements. And w now one of the challenges we find, though, is that many of the, uh, the First Nations want to be partners in prosperity, want to move their people, often in remote areas from poverty, to opportunity through infrastructure jobs, um, construction jobs. Um, but they don't have the financial depth to do so. And in many cases, they don't have the financial expertise or, or, or experience. So that my government has recently created a new st a crown corporation, a state enterprise, called the Indigenous Opportunities Corporation, backstopped by a billion dollars of our credit to support Aboriginal co-ownership or financial participation in major resource projects. And there's great excitement about this. I brought together all 48 of our Indigenous chiefs shortly after being elected, and there was virtual unanimity about being partners in that kind of an approach. Great, thank you. Governor Herbert. Well, thank you. We're honoured to have you all here as premiers and, and welcome. We've had you many times before, and we hope you keep coming back. Um, Premier Mo talked about the great athletes in Canada, and I'm proud to be the father-in-law of one of the greatest wide receivers in CFL history, Ben Cahoon. Yes, sir. Played for the Alouettes. That's right. And, uh, you are correct. He was one of the greatest. In the Hall of Fame. Retired Absolutely. Years yep. in fact. So we have fond memories in, of those days, and we appreciate our friends to the north. My question for you is this. You mentioned, uh, Premier Kenny, about uh, the delays that occur. It, it seems that we have not only the political fights here in the, in the states, but sometimes we those go into the to the legal courts and uh, litigation after litigation after litigation, a, a long many years delay. What are you doing in Canada that maybe we can learn from? It seems that you don't have as much litigation there as we have. Down oh, here. Don't <laughs> be so sure about that. We're in the courts. Uh, <laughs> how long? Because I've heard at least in Calgary and, and the energy things there that. Once you've made a decision, we have an EPA process that seems to never end. Once there's been a decision made, then don't we come to a, an end where there's no more litigation, no more lawsuits? Allowed? I, I think we all wish that were true, but it's, I don't think it's been our experience. Um, and part of that is because of the, uh, the recent jurisprudence over the ind obligation to consult Indigenous people on their traditional territories, because quite frankly, not even the courts were entirely clear what that meant. Uh, but we had a very important legal dis uh, uh, decision um, Earlier this week, it was on Tuesday, right. where the federal appeals court said, as long as, the, as there's a good faith effort to consult with Indigenous people, um, a decision, once a decision has been made as being in the public interest, you must proceed. I'll give you one example. We've got this, this uh, Trans Mountain uh, pipeline going to the West Coast. 129 First Nations were consulted. 120, according to the court, were in favor or not opposed. Only five were opposed. And the court has finally said, the five do not get to stop progress for the other 120. So there is now legal, I would say, legal clarity for the first time in a long time in Canada, at least on that dimension of law. And I, I think in, in fairness to that, this process has uh, provided that, that uh, example of how we all need to do better on, on consultation and, and integrating, uh, you know, all along the route into uh, the opportunity for ownership and participation. And, and in these, these resource projects, I spoke to the forestry industry. Uh, they, they truly do want to participate in some meaningful way. And you, they're, they're long and, and brought, drawn out conversations from time to times that do end up in the court uh, from time to times, uh, but we are doing better, I think, as we take steps forward in the nation. Uh, and I'd like to, you know, comment in relation to the beginning <coughs> and part of the, the consultation process has been trying to define what that consultation process really is and, and what, what parameters have to be covered. Uh, you know, a previous government for us you know, try, um, tried to expand an LNG operation because we are um, a, a natural gas operation, which we have significant resources. But it wasn't successful, and, and we're taking a, a new approach here to work with the First Nations uh, to help move it, because, because what we're learning, I, I think, and, and it's, it's, it's time to learn this, is that we need their help. We need their help to move big projects forward and, and avoid some of this litigation and these efforts, because it's a, it's a new day. And uh, I think we've seen it right in our own province to expand on that natural resource and to, um, and to move in an LNG export uh, way to, uh, for the future. So uh, we learn along the way, and the sad part, sometimes we don't, the lessons learned aren't, aren't uh, let's say, taken and, and uh, moved forward. They just are repeated. Governor Burgum. Thank you. Uh, I just want to say thanks to all the premiers that are here today. Uh, as a state that has a 330-mile-long border with uh, Canada, I especially want to uh, say hello to uh, our neighbor to the north, uh, Premier Mo, and 
I know with, along with him and uh, Premier Palliser from Manitoba, uh, we've really been operating as neighbors because as, as, as a number of the premiers have said, this isn't just about the built environment uh, that connects us, it's also families. We've got people that grow up in North Dakota that the nearest hospital is uh, across the border and that's where they're born. Uh, we've got uh, people that are farming on both sides of the border that might be hauling their grain to the nearest grain elevators on the other side of the border. Uh, and this has been going on for hundreds of years. Uh, in addition to the built environment, we've also got uh, rivers. We've got two, uh, the Suris River and the Red River of the North, both which uh, one starts in Canada, comes down in North Dakota, goes back to Canada. The other one that uh, forms the border of North Dakota and Minnesota goes north. We have over $3 billion of flood protection projects going on. Uh, on those two rivers in North Dakota, but we, again, the, the ability for us to have basin-wide uh, collaboration on those projects uh, has been uh, fantastic, because we might be two countries, but we're in one, and the, the water doesn't know which country it's in, and yeah. we've got to work together across those things. And so the other last thank you I want to say is, uh, uh, and people may not know, you know, of course, this is one of the longest borders in the world that has for centuries uh, been between two countries where neither has invaded each other. I guess with the exclusion of the football players and the hockey players going back and forth, there's been no, uh, no invasion. But we have, that in North Dakota, dedicated uh, along with uh, Manitoba and the country Canada, there's an international peace garden. The garden actually spans the border. So without, uh, you can enter the garden and it's an extensive uh, uh, multi-mile long place and you can pass and forth freely between the countries. It's a unique thing in the world. And this last year, our legislature dedicated $5 million for infrastructure improvements in the, in the in there with the idea that it would be a match from uh, Canada and we uh, understand it's moving forward with the legislatures but we hope to have that happen uh, and we've talked about the uh, First Nations and the Indigenous people when the, when it was created in the 1930s uh, there was a beautiful peace chapel built on the border celebrating this amazing, amazing relationship between our two countries but it, it had quotes from 60 leaders around the world around peace but none of the Native nations were represented in that. And so we're also going through the process of reestablishing through flag ceremonies and quotes to get the Native nations included in that. So we appreciate uh, on a number of fronts the, the great partnership with uh, our neighbors to the north. And the last thing I'd say, we have a booming economy in North Dakota. We have 30,000 jobs open. All my governors around the table say, well, we don't have to worry about any of our people ever moving all the way up north to North Dakota <laughs> to go to work. And so I've told uh, Premier Palliser and the mayor of Manitoba, or mayor of Winnipeg, that we're only looking for 30,000 people to move south to North Dakota <laughs> to fill all those jobs. So we've got our solution to our, our workforce all figured out. But thank you. Just a comment. Oh. I just have to correct the governor on one point, small point of history. There was an invasion. In fact, there were three invasions of the Irish Fenians from New York State that you guys got loaded up and they sent up north in 1867, but that only lasted about 48 hours. So, <laughs> <laughs> And, and, and uh, Governor, you're, you're exactly right. The integration of families across the border, in particular uh, in a close, uh, where we have a shared border between North Dakota and Saskatchewan is, uh, is closer than, than, than even we may know, as there, there may be uh, one individual on this stage that has a, a daughter that is, uh, for the last four years, has been attending MSU in Minot, North Dakota, and is now looking very much at the UND and Grand Forks and she's I think eyeing up one of those 30,000 jobs down there maybe at, at the end of the day and uh, I'm hoping she comes back to see her father every now and again I guess I let the big cat out of the bag on who that is but you're, you're right with respect to water infrastructure and some of the that's direct public investment for the most part that has been occurring uh, north and south of the border for decades now on uh, that particular river system that impacts Saskatchewan uh, North Dakota as well as Manitoba and, and we have a, a significant size dam just north of the border where we have a joint operating agreement on that dam uh, so that we are, are always talking uh, with respect to when the gates are open how they are opening and and uh, and that investment is is happening north of the border um, doing its best to protect uh, people south of the border and then coming back as the water flows uh, back into Manitoba and I know there's been uh, tremendous amounts of infrastructure more recently uh, invested in in uh, North Dakota on that very same river system and it's really a, a joint investment coming at it from both sides of that that uh, 49th parallel that is uh, for the benefit of, of so many. And uh, uh, first of all uh, Governor you're 100% correct we we have the largest unprotected border in the entire world. There's no two countries that are more intertwined like this than Canada and the United States. 
and I, I know I can speak for all of us, we're so grateful to have the greatest neighbor in the entire world, the United States. Uh, one, one thing, Governor, uh, we need 250,000 people up in Ontario to fill the jobs. So after you get your 30,000, send the 250,000 up to, up to Ontario. But uh, if, they, they, if they came from North Dakota to Ontario, they'd be going down, not up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm in all the states. Bring them up. I love them. We have maybe time for one last question, if anybody has one. Uh, let, let me just quickly, we're just, uh, just about out of time. But we we j talked about the USMCA. Anybody want to just weigh in on, on what this might mean or just touch on kind of where you are in the process, how long it's going to take to get it done, uh, what it's going to mean for, for you and for us? Uh, on the process, um, we, uh, several of us met with uh, Representative Lighthizer yesterday and deputy, with our Deputy Prime Minister, Christia Freeland, and we committed to do everything we can to accelerate this through Parliament. It has just been sent to committee. There was a federal election, so we were a little bit behind the curve in terms of getting this done. Yeah. But uh, all 13 premiers, as the Premier Mose mentioned, we've uh, committed to try to get this accelerated, and I hope within a matter of days. Wonderful. That's my hope, anyway. Yeah. Yeah, that, like right. I say, 13 premiers from all different political stripes are firmly behind this agreement, uh, representing every square inch of Canada and representing collectively every every single Canadian. So this is uh, an important agreement that, that all Canadians are behind, and we uh, look forward to having at least an initiative in the next number of days, um, and, uh, and then it will flow through our parliamentary process, which does take a little bit of time, um, but ultimately, uh, um, you know, it is going to be ratified uh, here in, in, in short order. Oh, that's fantastic. So we're going to take about a 15-minute break before our keynote address by Secretary of State Mike Pompeo. Please <coughs> join me in giving a big NGA thank you to our premiers for joining us for this panel. That was great. Thank you very well, thank much. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much. Really, a wonderful. Thank you, guys. Hope you'll stick around for yeah.